and welcome this morning. Good to see you. Hopefully you had a great week and what a beautiful way to start this week off, coming together and worship the Lord. A couple of things that are going on. Um, our Wednesday lunch bunch, we started that last week at noontime, so I want to invite you to come um, from noon to, uh, it's one to one, one thirty. it all depends. We're done by one, but we stick around if you want um, to just kind of have good conversations. So I'm here, and so hopefully you'll, um, you'll come out, bring a bag lunch, and if you don't have one or you forget it, there'll be one here for you. I can't promise what will be in it, but you'll have a bag lunch anyway. Um, and if you come Wednesday night and you didn't have anything to eat, there just might be something there for you too. So uh, if you come on Wednesday for prayer and you're hungry, you had to come from work, you didn't have time to stop home, well, nobody takes the lunch. There'll be one in there for you also. Our movie night is this Saturday. So it's in the bulletin. Please take, um, there are some announcements out on the front table. Please take those with you. Invite family and friends to come to the movie night. Um, we Bought a Zoo. It's a family-centric movie, so hopefully you'll come out 8 o'clock, and we're going to have some hot dogs, and that's what I want to bring to your attention. We're talking about, um, you know, rather than going out and buying a big bulk of hot dogs, that if you could, we'll be here, I'll be here on Wednesday, and I'm here all day Wednesday. So if you have the opportunity and you'd like to donate a couple of packages of hot dogs, well, go and, and bring them to the church um, on Wednesday. So, uh, and we'll, again, I'll be here by uh, usually 11 o'clock in the morning on Wednesday, and I'm here right through uh, 8 o'clock on Wednesday night. So um, there's plenty of time if you like. We thought rather than going out and buying a whole bunch of them. So get a couple of packets of hot dogs. We don't know how many people are going to come to this movie. Um, there might be a handful of people. Or there might be a couple hundred. We have no clue. So um, we figure, well, there's eight dogs in a pack. If everybody brings a couple packs of hot dogs, we've got a fair amount of hot dogs. And Hannaford's right up the road. We can always get some more. Dylan. I was, I was almost going to say... Don't get fancy, yeah. I just get regular hot dogs. Yeah, nothing stuffed inside. Um, except for the people you don't like. I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, it's just regular. And, and make sure that they have salt and, and all kinds of stuff. I mean, right? Make, make sure it's a hot dog. We're not going green. Okay, so anyway, just kidding. We, yeah, so uh, and then uh, we're going to reach out uh, to Fryhoffers for the rolls. But, but hot dogs would be great. And, um, but again, we hope that we'll get a boatload of people coming here. But this is the first, it's experimental. So we'll have hot dogs, we'll be popping some corn, and everybody gets a soft drink, so we'll be, we'll be good to go. So that's Saturday night at 8 o'clock. Pray for clouds, but no rain. The sun doesn't set until quite a bit late, so Dave and Darcy are up here trying to position the best place to where you can get the the screen outside. So we're going to position right over here in the corner by the steps and going to build some things up. But we want a cloudy night, but not rainy night. And um, pray all goes well. All right. I don't have anything else. And if you don't, Tori, would you open us in prayer this morning? Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you as a people with thanksgiving in our hearts for your mercy, for your faithfulness, for your goodness. Um, thank you that you cleanse us from our iniquities, heal our diseases, and redeem us from the pit. We thank you for that, God, for you are great. And I pray that this time of worship would be a blessing to you and a blessing to us as we are unified as, as a people and that we would be able to boldly approach your throne as your children. Um, and we cry, Abba, Father, for you are Father and you are a good Father. And we thank you for your mercy towards us and the fact that we can approach you. So I pray, Lord, that this would be a beautiful time of singing in unity and hearing your word and hearing your truth. And may your spirit um, be so present with us as we worship you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand together as we sing this beautiful hymn, Jesus Paid It All, thanking the Lord that he has paid it all through his son Jesus, who is our righteousness.
when I sing that song, and we, we haven't sung that song in a while, but whenever I do, there's one person who comes to mind, and that's Joe Brundage. Um, it's hard to believe, but um, eight years ago, today, I began a fresh air. Bev's like, oh my goodness. <laughs> but, um, and one of the first songs, if not the first one, that we sang here was Under His Wings. And so that's a real precious song to me. And also it's a, it's a reminder of Joe and her ministry when she was here as well. So uh, thinking of, of that, uh, we were just talking earlier this morning. Joe is still playing the piano at Home of the Good Shepherd. And so they need some hymnals. And she has the old purple ones. And so David and I were talking this morning. So we're going to get a bunch of the hymnals here over to Home of the Good Shepherd for them to use. And as Marshall and I were talking, you know, uh, Lottie Flewelling has gone home to be with the Lord. Um, and I was thinking, even asking, you know, that COVID has taken us out of the ability to see some of those who have been shut in and, and the nursing homes. And, and I was even wondering, is, is Ella still with us? And she is. And, and I was thinking about Lottie as I was going through the season saints list this past week. And, and sure enough, I said, well, Lottie, and I started wondering, is Lottie still with us? And uh, she's not. Uh, but she was when I was looking at the list, but she's home with the Lord now. But um, it's just that we've lost so much. And Marshall and I were talking to us to see if we can get back into the nursing homes, not just to visit, but also to reestablish, hopefully, the nursing home ministry that uh, uh, we had and still have uh, over at Fort Hudson. So, uh, but, uh, but Lottie is, is home with the Lord this morning, and uh, Joe is still praising the Lord at Home of the Good Shepherd. So, all, all good news this morning. Well, let's go to our Heavenly Father in prayer today. Lord, we thank you that we are under your wings, where we may safely abide forever. What a beautiful truth that you give to us, Lord. We thank you, Father, that you have washed us from our sin, that you have paid it all, once and for all, a ransom for many, for all who would come at the drawing of you, Heavenly Father, to your Son's precious bleeding inside, and then, Lord, receive grace and mercy. We thank you, Father, that it is not your will that any should perish, we thank you, Father, that we have no excuse. We thank you, Lord, that each one of us, there is, a, there is a desire for God, but we cannot on our own. But, Lord, you have sent the Spirit of the living God into the world to convict the, the world of its sin and of your righteousness and of the judgment to come. And Lord, we thank you that you have done a work in those who are gathered here today. But Lord, so many, so many are ready, Lord. The field is ripe for harvest. And how I pray that we will gladly go. And Father, it is in your hands. We simply obey and we leave all the consequences to you. And we thank you, Father, that whatever the results are, they are by your divine, perfect, and pleasing will that will bring you glory. And Lord, that is our desire this morning, to bring you glory. All that we have to being poured out to all who you are. And I pray, Lord, that would humble us this morning. Father, we think of the, the home going of Lottie Flewelling, and Father, she's rejoicing with you. Her mind is once again made well. And we lift up her family to you, Lord. We thank you for the, the long life that you gave her here. But we do pray for those who will, who will miss her presence. We think of Joe this morning, and Lord, how she still, in her, her tender years, Lord, still desires to use the gift that you have given to her and to bless those through music at the home of the Good Shepherd. Lord, um, how I pray that we will soon be able to all be able to go back to these places to meet with 
these folks who we love dearly to, again, Lord, bring them to a place where they can congregate together and to sing praises and bring glory to you, Lord. So, Father, open up the ministry at the home of the Good Shepherd, at the Fort Hudson, Lord, the nursing homes around, and for churches who, who desire. And, Lord, where there is a need, I pray we'll fill the gap. We'll fill that need, Lord. Um, these dear, precious saints who belong to you, Lord, who once served you gladly in the fellowship within the rest of the body of Christ, now, Lord, are sequestered into these dwelling places. But how, Lord, the body of Christ, I pray, will go to them. Thank you for today, Lord, and the freedom that you've given for us to come and to worship you and to declare that you are the Lord God. You are God from everlasting to everlasting. We thank you for the covenant that you have made with the church in the blood of your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. May we not forget that beautiful covenant of the New Testament in our Savior's blood. Father, as the word goes forth this morning, how I pray you would train us up by it and we would, by your power and alone, teach others who are in so desperate need to hear. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So the psalm that I'm going to sing is um, Psalm 121, and the words are taken straight out of the psalm. And I, I set it to the tune of, of the Father's Love Begotten, which is a 13th century hymn tune. So it's the psalm with the hymn tune. Um, so I, I'm hoping we can sing this as a congregation, but I wanted to give you a chance to hear it so that you can become more familiar with it. Um, so hopefully we'll sing this next week. But I hope that you'll be blessed by the words of this psalm. I almost hate to preach this message. It's in total contrast to what we just heard. Psalm 121 is perhaps one of my favorite psalms. 
was one of the first psalms that I think I ever learned. And it's a beautiful psalm set to a beautiful melody. So thank you for bringing that. And now we're going to look at the case of a sinful tongue. What a contrast. When you look at what God's word is, when you look at the purity and the holiness of Almighty God as we read his word, and, and, and especially when you look at some of the Psalms in particular, we see the beauty of God's music, the, the Hebrew hymnal being sung and um, what it must have been like for those Old Testament saints to go out and to sing those, those psalms to one another. And we heard just one of those this morning. I've been going through the depravity of, of man, the, the heart, and God is making a case against humanity. And he's making a case for the sin nature and the total depravity of man. And in Romans chapter 3, verses 13 and 14, he brings yet another case before the court. In Romans chapter 3, verses 13 and 14, he says, Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive the venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Wow, that is a far cry from the hymns we have sung this morning and the special music. I was reading an interesting illustration of a man working in a produce department in a little grocery store. And a woman came in and she said, Sir, may I buy a half a head of lettuce? He replied, Half a head, ma'am? Are you serious? And so she says, Well, he said, Look, God grows full heads of lettuce. He doesn't grow half heads of lettuce. And that's how we sell them. You mean, she persisted, that after all of these years that I have shopped here and given you my business, you won't sell me a half a head of lettuce. Look, he said, if you like, I'll ask the manager. She said, well, thank you very much. Well, the young man marched up to the grocery manager who was there in the front of the store. And he says, you will not believe this. He said, there is a lame braided idiot of a lady back there who wants to know if she can buy a half a head of lettuce. He noticed the manager gesturing and turned around to see the lady standing behind him. Obviously, she had followed him to the front of the store. And the young man, without making a pause, he looked at her and he said, and this nice lady was wondering if she could buy the other half. Well, the manager concluded later on in the day, he said, this young man is a smart guy. I'm glad he's working with me. So he goes and he confronts the young man. And he says, young man, I have to tell you, that was the finest example of thinking on your feet that I have ever ever heard. Where did you learn that? He said, well, sir, I grew up in Grand Rapids. And if you know anything about Grand Rapids, you know that it's known for its great hockey teams and its ugly women. The manager's face was flushed and he interrupted and he said, my wife is from Grand Rapids, to which the young man said, and which hockey team did she play for? There is the case for a sinful tongue. Romans is saying that the tongue is foul and it is corrupt. And Paul uses this very illustrative description of the throat being an open sepulcher or an open grave. 
an open grave is foul. Because an open grave contains that which is now rotting. That which is decaying. It is a symbol of corruption. When we go to the cemeteries, we do not leave the graves open. We cover them. In fact, there is a state rule through the Department of Health. You may wonder, why do they bury six feet under? For two reasons. One, it's what the state says. And number two, animals will dig. Animals will dig. And, um, of course, now we're, we're encased in all kinds of things. You've got a casket inside of a vault, inside of something else. And so all of these rules and, and, and everything else. The grave is a symbol of corruption. And Paul says, so is the mouth. So is the mouth a symbol of corruption. It is a it, humanness without Christ. And I dare say, even for those who are being discipled, but he is saying that the depravity of man is revealed in the mouth. He is saying that the mouth is foul. In other words, it uses foul language. It uses language that is polluted. We offend one another with our, with our mouths. We profane one another. We gossip about one another. We say things that are detestable and divisive toward one another. If you think, and you don't have to think too hard about this, but when you look at where our nation is today, much of what we are seeing is based upon what we have heard. We have deceptive language coming from our politicians. Lies flow freely from their mouths. They can't even tell the truth about our health care. But not only our politicians, but also the medical community. It's divisive. It cannot tell the truth about, you would think, something so precious, one's personal health. You would think there would be no argument about that. That they could get together and say, A is A and B is B, but they have conflated so much and confused so much. Why? Because the mouth is an open grave. Much of what we see, we can trace back to what we have heard. This morning I was asked the question, have the United Methodists stopped using the Bible? Yes, they have. And if they are still using the Bible, they ought not to have a pride flag hanging out in front of their church. They ought not to have lesbians or homosexuals preaching the word of God. That's sin. Quite frankly, it's not just the United Methodists. But we can look to our own Baptists. We can look to the American Baptists that are doing the same thing. We can look to the Presbyterians and some of those who have gone the same way. We can look to the Episcopals. We can look all around the world of denominations and we can say that we have stopped using the purity of God's word and have replaced it with the polluted words of man. And what has that created? This church has split away from this church and this denomination, from that denomination, and all other things. And it starts at a very young age. Not necessarily young as we would call ourselves young or old. But it starts very early on 
with something not so egregious, but something trying to justify what the scriptures do not teach to match what the congregation wants. The word of God is very clear. Women are not to occupy the role of pastor, elder, deacon. It is in the Greek. It is masculine. You cannot change the masculine. I know there are attempts to do that in our society today, the feminine and the masculine, but we cannot interchange the two. God's word is God's word. And he speaks clearly on it. But the obscene mouth is not just for the foulest of language or for the most divisive speech. It's also from immoral suggestions and off-colored humor to dirty jokes. Paul is saying, no matter what, the mouth is foul and it stinks like an open grave. And the filthiness of the mouth causes corruption. You see, it's what springs forth that causes the corruption. An open grave may stink. But in and by itself, it can't do anything but smell until you get around it. And when you get around it, the disease that pours forth can in fact infect another individual. The Egyptians used to think, or some people opening up the Egyptian car, um, sarcophaguses used to believe that there would be a curse because some people would die when they opened up the sarcophagus. They would get terribly sick. Or well, there was no curse on that. What it is is this. There's bacteria in there. And the bacteria comes out even after thousands of years. It's a corrupt fowl. It's not supposed to be disturbed. And so the people breathe it in and they get sick and some have died when the Romans were persecuting the church in AD 70 they crucified so many that they ran out of wood there were no more trees to cut down and so as the bodies were rotting on the crosses they would take the other condemned and they, of course, would whip and beat that person so they would have open wounds. And they would take the person who was to be crucified and they would crucify that person on the dead body so that the infection from the crucified dead one would go into the crucified one who was not yet dead. That is a pretty interesting illustration, though, isn't it? When we think about our foulness and the corruption of sin. And the Bible says that we have been crucified with Christ. He has taken all of my foulness. And he has given me, he has given us his righteousness. The mouth from what we eat, eats away our character. Think of that for just a moment. It eats away the character of those who are listening. When you think about what our young people are listening to today, it is eating away their character. And yet with divisive and deceptive speech, there are those who will rally to say, no, there's nothing wrong with that, and try to justify. You want to know what's happening in our world today? Our young people have been exposed to hours upon hours upon hours of sitting before a computer, that which is designed to be good and to enhance our knowledge, and yet it has spoken to our young people and it is polluting our young people. And not just the computers, but music, 
so many other things that were designed for good, but Satan has taken them and he has twisted them. And the mouths of those who should know better have become silent or who have deceived others into allowing these things to take place. And what has happened, it has eaten away the character of young people and of also middle of the road and the very aged. You see, the foul mouth kills character. It kills attractiveness, trust and faithfulness, morality, honor, and godliness. There used to be a saying long ago for men, and it used to be that that man has the mouth of a sailor. So if you're in the Navy, it says something about our Navy men. Or the other would be this person swears like a trooper. So if you work for the state police or we're in the Navy, right there, you're convicted. Come repenting of your sin. But I used to say, there's nothing worse. You could deal with a drunk man. He was a brawler, but there's nothing worse than a drunk woman. Because a drunk woman has one of the foulest mouths you will ever hear. The character has been eroded by other things. Sometimes we say, well, it's expected for the man, but it's not either. But to see beauty, the beauty of a woman, corrected by the filthiness of foul language, there's nothing worse to hear. Because morality has also been compromised, and so has godliness and so has attractiveness. There's nothing attractive about a foul mouth. I worked for a, a man. He was our chief. He was out of New York City. This man, I had never heard a man, and I had been around a lot of cops. I had never heard one curse so much and so loudly in all my life. It would not matter if there were women in the room at all. He would curse at them with the same foul mouth as he would another man. And do you know what the office thought of him? He is the most ignorant man who has ever lived. And do you know why? He's supposed to be a man who holds high position, and he's too stupid to even come up with a word. He has to use foul language in every other word. They said, that's an ignorant and stupid man. His foul language has corrupted his very character. The very thing that the scripture teaches, we see it in our world. Jesus said, oh, generation of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak good things for out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. How can you speak good things? You're evil. And James writes, and the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members that it defileth the whole body and setteth on fire the course of nature. And it is set on fire fire of hell. Wow. It is set on fire of hell. The case for total depravity and the sin nature of man. And the case against the sinful tongue is this. It is set on fire of hell. The writer of Proverbs says, for their heart studieth destruction and the lips talk of mischief. A sinful tongue is foul and corrupt. But a sinful tongue, Paul says, is also a tongue that is deceitful, 
they use their tongues to deceive. They use their tongues to deceive. You know, some of the best illustrations that a preacher ought to always have are the illustrations within their own life. If you're teaching, the best illustrations you ought to have are through life experience. And so the best illustration I can give to you for this one is my life experience and sitting across from people who will deceive and deceive and deceive trying to get out of something. And the interesting thing is, is that they are not intent on lying. They don't come there with that intent. They're not, quote unquote, pathological. They're not sociopaths. There's a very, very few number of people that are actually sociopaths that go in there lying and really believing it's the truth. Most people go in and have spoken to me and have told me the truth until they get to the point where they have to admit what they have done. <laughs> and they hold back. They use all kinds of language to camouflage their words. But their own words corrupt their character and their own words prove them to be who they are. They are deceitful. Some are deceitful because they don't want the consequences of what they've done. But some other people will deceive because they are fearful. Peter, when he was asked, do you know, you know this man? Peter says, no, I don't. I don't know who he is. Why was Peter saying that? You could have asked Peter about the other disciples. You could have asked Peter in that moment, wasn't this Jesus, Jesus who fed 5,000? Isn't this Jesus whom they're beating in there, the same one who healed the blind and the deaf and, and raised that little 12-year-old girl? Isn't that, Peter would have said, yes, that's Jesus, and you were one of him. No, I wasn't. I, and here's the deceptive words, the ambiguous language. Peter says, I do not know that man. He could not even say, Jesus, I do not know that man. I do not know him. It's the ambiguous language. What happened? All of a sudden, fear set in. And Peter realized in that moment that if I say, yes, I know him, the same gangs that were beating him will be the same gangs that will take me and crucify me with him. This happens all the time. You sit across from people who were involved in gangs or with, with drug dealers. They will use all deceptive language. Why? So that they don't want to tell the truth? No, it's because they're afraid. Fear sets in. You seek a, a young woman who has just been violated and you have to speak with her. And you wonder why is she not being truthful? She's afraid. She's embarrassed. She's shamed. There are so many reasons why people are deceitful. But nonetheless, he says the tongue is deceitful. Abraham Lincoln met a man who was disputing him. He was a stubborn disputer as it is written. And he was unconvinced of what Lincoln was saying. And so the man said, well, let's see. How many legs has a cow? That's what Lincoln asks. Four, of course, came the reply. That's right, agreed Lincoln. Now suppose you call the cow's tail a leg. How many legs would the cow have? Why, five, of course, Mr. Lincoln. Lincoln said, now that's where you're wrong. Calling a cow's tail a leg doesn't make it a leg. Deceptive tongues. And people fall for deceptive speech and are deceived Every day. The Hebrew says that they make smooth their tongue. That's how deceit is used. It is a false tongue. A lying tongue. It is a flattering tongue. It is a tongue that misleads. It is a tongue that devises 
treachery. It is a smooth talking tongue. It is a flattering tongue. The word deceit here is a continuous action. And what it means is this. They kept on deceiving. We're not only guilty of deceiving, but Paul says we are guilty of constantly deceiving. In other words, constantly hiding and camouflaging what we are really thinking and feeling and how our behavior is. Why? Because, as I said, we seek to protect ourselves. We become like the little child in the classroom when the teacher asks, where's your homework? Um, it's in my locker. Remember that response? Do you remember what the teacher would say? Well, go get it. Uh -oh. Uh-oh. It was there yesterday. Somebody must have broke into my locker. <laughs> we keep on going and going and going. Keep on constantly deceiving rather than saying, I didn't do it. I'm going to get a zero for it. But we don't do that. We camouflage these and our behavior proves it out. Because we seek to protect what we have or what we are going after. A sinful tongue is a deceitful tongue. Where is that deceit born out of? It's born out of a sin nature. This is the depravity of man. Psalm 10, 7, his mouth is full of cursing and deceit and fraud. Under his tongue is mischief and vanity. Psalm 36, 3, the words of his mouth are iniquity and deceit. He hath left off to be wise and to do good. The words of his mouth were smoother than butter, but war was in his heart. His words were softer than oil, yet they were drawn swords. Psalm 55, 21, and we can go through and through and through the Psalms. Jeremiah 9, 5 says, And they will deceive every one of his neighbor and will not speak the truth. They have taught their tongue to speak lies. Notice something. They have taught their tongue to speak lies and weary themselves to commit iniquity. And he says again in Jeremiah 17, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? And then he sa Micah says, For the rich men... Thereof are full of violence, and the inhabitants thereof have spoken lies, and their tongue is deceitful in their mouth, Micah 6, 12. And finally, Nahum 3, 1. Woe to the bloody city. It is all full of lies and robbery. The prey departs not. Wow, there's several cities that I can think of right now. And more to come. But he goes on to say that not only is the tongue foul, not only is the tongue deceitful, but he says the tongue is piercing and it's poisonous. It's piercing and it is poisonous. Verse number 13, again, he says, the venom of asps is under their Lips. Wow. The poison of asps is under their lips. The asp is the cobra. It's something when you look at a snake, isn't it? I mean, the snake kind of slithers around. Its tongue flips out and goes in and flips out and goes in. And, and you can take a garter snake or whatever and some of those non-poisonous snakes. I mean, if you catch it just right, you know, I don't know, maybe, maybe the tongue will come out and it will, it will touch your hand. Nothing will happen at all. In fact, you can look at a cobra. And a cobra looks like it has a normal, right, normal snake head. It's a big snake. But slithering around until all of a sudden what happens? It comes up and wow. That thing fans out and it begins to hiss. And what do you see? It's not a little cute tongue anymore. That thing has got fangs under its lips. 
and every fang is like a needle. And when that cobra strikes, he doesn't have to hold on for a little while like a needle's drawing blood. When that cobra strikes, or that venomous snake strikes, it strikes, and in that instant, its fangs pierce, and the venom goes through, and it's in your system, and you're done for if you don't get a shot real quick. This is what the Word of God is, is speaking of here, that we have tongues that are just as piercing as the deadly cobra. The idea is that some people have a diabolical nature. They're filled with so much malice that they're out to inflict punishment. But a tongue and its deceitfulness is also one that gossips. A gossip is so dangerous, spreads such poison, that the word of God declares that unless the gossip repents, the gossip shall not see the kingdom of heaven. And remember one thing about a person who gossips to you. If they gossip to you, they will gossip about you. Because like a snake's tongue, it continually is moving. The tongue cannot stop talking. How many churches, how many churches, and when I say churches, I mean people, have fallen prey to gossips rather than doing what Matthew 18 says. If you have something to say, go say it to that person. Talk to that person about it. Don't commit it to another person to go tell that person. That's hearsay. That is hearsay. I have made it a rule that if somebody comes to me and says, I was talking to another person and they're a little concerned, I will say to them, then you bring that person to me. Because unless I hear it from them, it did not happen. My own illustration in law enforcement, when you go to the stand, they ask for documentation. If you don't have that documentation, guess what? It did not happen. It has to be direct. There is a hearsay rule. Gossips spread malice. And they're to be dealt with. Swiftly, certainly in the church. A poisonous tongue poisons character and reputation. It's a tongue that starts rumors and has nothing to back it up. Because it seeks to hurt and to destroy. Think of that. If somebody starts a rumor, what is the purpose behind a rumor? Can it bring any good Rather than going to the person and saying, hmm. Or if the person whom they heard it from, that person should stand there and say, what evidence do you have to support what you are saying? Well, this, then have you gone to that person? Because if you have not, you are allowing that person, if it is true, to decline, to despair. You're withholding the truth, and that is not love. In fact, it demonstrates hate. It demonstrates hate. But now you also put off all these things. He tells us to put off anger. Boy, when we're angry, we can really, really say things that we ought not to say. My granddaughter locked me out of my son and daughter-in-law's house the other, the other day. I was telling Marshall about, I think, some of the folks there last week. She's five years old. She came home from nursery school, and apparently she had a bad day. Her mother told her she had to take a nap, and she ran inside the house. And I was talking to my daughter-in-law outside, and my little grandson was running around, and we went to go inside the house. I was carrying the car seat back in, and the door was locked. No matter what we did... She wasn't going to open that door. Gee, I'm tired. Guess what? I'm trying to find a way into the house, and I had to get a ladder. 
And the only window that I could go through was a kitchen window. And I had no Crisco with me. So I had to get through a kitchen window. Now I will tell you something. I was not happy, to say the least. And for a moment, I was thinking, when I get inside this house, she's going to get a reprimand. And I'm not her father, but boy, if she was mine, she'd get more than a reprimand. But what was I? I was angry. I was angry. And by the time I got myself through that window and had to go headlong over the kitchen sink, I was even more angry. But then, as I safely landed, I realized something. And it wasn't me who caused me to realize it. I said, you know, God, thank you that at my age, I can still get through a kitchen window. And thank you that there was nothing serious going on in the house that could have caused any harm. And thank you for my granddaughter. She's a little girl. And while she needs to be taught some things, she needs to know that her grandpa loves her. And so I went in and, and I talked with her. I said, honey, I love you with all my heart. But mommy and daddy, or mommy and your grandpa are out there. I said, if something happened in here, well, I'm not going to give the little gentle speech I gave to her, but she gave me a kiss and we had a hug. But in the, oh, a moment of anger, and I would have lashed out at a little five-year-old, what could that do to her toward me? But it doesn't matter if you're five years old, 25, 50, or 105. Just think at what a lashing out of the tongue can do to another person in anger. Because when you think of this and how God has put this in his word, what is born out of the anger, there's wrath in that anger. I want something to happen to that person. There's malice in that anger. And sometimes we blaspheme the name of God in our speech. And then all kinds of foul and filthy communication come out, out of that Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings, there is that that speaketh like the piercings of a sword. They have sharpened their tongues like serpent adders. Poison is under their lips. Well, I'm going to close with this final point here in verse number 14. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Whose mouth is full of cursings and bitterness? Cursing is a sin and a cursing tongue is a sinful tongue. Jesus says this, swear not at all, but let your communication be yes, yes, or no, no. For whatsoever is more than these comes of evil. Wow. Now, let's get back to the men. Because men use profanity. It is interesting that in the pastoral epistles in 1 Timothy chapter 3, when Paul tells Timothy, these are the qualification for the elders, for the pastors, and for the deacons. These are the qualifications. And you look at the character. This is what they're looking at. This is the character of the person. And Paul goes through these things. And when you look at the character of the person for the men, guess what? Most of these guys you got to be careful of because, Timothy, you're going to be dealing with drunks and you're going to be dealing with brawlers. You're going to be dealing with, with men, okay, who will at any cost, you're going to want to fight. Timothy, they have to be sober-minded. And they have to be sober when they come to church. They can't start fights and be brawling, right? They may want to, but can't. And they have to be able to teach. And they have to be able to manage their household. And they have to love the wife and be faithful to the wife that they have right now. He goes through the very same qualifications as a deacon. The only thing is for the deacon is that there's no requirement to teach. 
but the deacon's character qualifications are very much the same. But it's interesting in verse 11 of chapter 3, he says, likewise the women, likewise their wives. So if you have an elder, pastor, if you have deacons, what does he say about the wives? We get back to slanderers and whisperers. But the wife disqualifies the husband because the husband has not been able to teach the wife. It's amazing what God's word has to say about who we are and how we ought to behave, both men and women. God knows that the men are more prone to be brawlers and foul mouthed and drunks. And the women are more prone to be gossips and backbiters. This is what the word of God speaks of. And it has to be dealt with. Men use profanity. Their mouth is full of cursing and swearing. Men curse both God and other men. It goes uh, from what society continue, would consider, well, that's just a mild word or a slang word. But no matter how mild, mild or slang it may be to society, God's case against man is that his mouth is full of cursing. But the tongue can tame, can no man tame. It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. Therewith bless we God even the Father, and therewith we curse men, which are made after the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursings. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. Not so to be. Why? Because the psalmist says that a man's cursing shall fall upon him. As he loved cursing, so let it come unto him. As he delighted not in blessing, so let it be far from him. As he clothed himself with cursing like as with his garment, so let it come into his bowels like water and like oil onto his bones. Full of cursing, man's mouth is full of bitterness. It is harsh, it is resentful, it is cynical, and it is unpleasant. And any expression involving any of these, God says, that is a sin unto me. And he desires that we would be filled with love, with joy, with peace, with long-suffering, with kindness and gentleness and faithfulness. And so he says, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you. With all malice. But if you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. God's case against the sinful tongue. God's case against the sinful tongue. And one of the ones here is that we make oaths, don't we? And maybe you're sitting there today, you're saying, God, I promise I will never do, say again. God's word says, don't make that vow to me. You can't keep it. You can't keep that vow. Don't make vows to other men. You can't keep them. But he does say this. If I go up to another person and I shake their hand and your yes is your net yes, it better be. You don't need a lawyer to draw up all kinds of contracts for you. But if your no is your no, then let it be. That's a contract. Because to do otherwise may or may not get you into a court of law. But it brings you before the holy and righteous God who said, let your yes be your yes and let your no be your no. Do not make vows to the world. Don't make those vows to the world. Don't swear. 
on the Bible and raise one hand elevated with the other hand on the Bible. Because you know what? When you take the stand, and I'm not talking about this world's court, but when we stand before Almighty God, he will call everything into question. How are we going to stand then? How will we stand? God gives us a case against the sinful tongue. So what do we do about it? What do we do about it? That ought to bring you godly sorrow. And he calls us to repentance and to confess that sin. And that God would fill us day by day. My last illustration. I worked with a man by the name of Tom DeVolis. He was a wonderful man. He really was. And he's, talk about a conservative guy. But Tom said to me one day, he said, Frank, I used to have the foulest of mouths. I used to have the foulest of mouths. But one day, he said, it's just that I realized this is not good not only for me, but for everyone who was around me. And Tom was a Greek Orthodox guy. And um, he said, I don't, I don't swear anymore. And he went to church, and I don't know exactly what he did, but I believe Tom got right with the Lord because no one could ever stop like this. And I mean, when I tell you, he, the valve was shut off. But Charles Spurgeon also said that when God saved him, he removed three-quarters of his vocabulary. This is Spurgeon. And so, men, women, what are we to do? Fall down on our knees before the one who has saved us and repent and confess of these sins and thank God for his mercies, his loving kindness, and for the shed blood on the cross which has forgiven us of our sins. Praise and glory. To Almighty God. Well, Tori, would you come and sing us out? Reminder tonight, we're going to be meeting at 6 o'clock. So we're going through the book of Isaiah. Please hope you'll be able to come and, and uh, be a part of that study. Tori?
and thou may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our dear Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Amen.